Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, our study today is going to focus on the end of Ezekiel chapter 17. I think if you had asked me about 10 days ago, what's Ezekiel 17 all about? I would have said, I I don't know. Not that familiar. So I'm going to invite you to take out your worship folder so you can follow along. We'll also make some indirect reference to the other readings, especially the gospel from Mark chapter 4. So how many of you have planted something this spring? A flower, a garden, vegetables? Okay, quite a few of you. I planted nothing. I have no green thumb. I don't want to water it. I don't want to weed it. I don't want to take care of it. But I'm glad that you plant things because today the Lord tells us that his kingdom is like planting a seed or a plant or in the case of our reading from Ezekiel, even the top of a tree. Now, God's kingdom is something that we actually pray about Probably every day, if you say the Lord's Prayer every day. Thy kingdom come. And even though it's so familiar, I wonder if I put you on the spot, could you describe to me what God's kingdom is and how it comes? Might be more challenging than you would expect. But today, through these parables or these earthly stories that teach us about the kingdom of God, we're going to learn that the Lord plants his kingdom. Let's start by just thinking about the idea of a kingdom. Would you agree that everyone wants their own kingdom? In fact, dads, isn't that what Father's Day is all about today? If not only for one day... You get to be the king of the castle, the the lord of the manor, the head of the house. Maybe people will blow compliments your way all day long and tell you how great you are and how much they love you and they appreciate everything they do. Maybe they'll bring you a nice cold beverage when you get home as you watch the Brewer game or they'll grill some brats for you. Maybe someone, it's too bad it's raining, maybe someone would even mow the lawn for you. Oh, Andrew. (laughs) Because we all want a kingdom. We all want to be in control. We all want to be in charge and we want to build up something that looks like value, whether that's wealth or influence or even if it's in this this little small corner of the world. We want to, at the very least, rule our own hearts or our own bodies. You hear that, right? It's my body. It's my choice. It's, it's my life. I can live it how I want to. It's my party. I can cry if I want to. It's, it's all about me and my kingdom. But there's a problem with that. On the one hand, it's so short-lived. Even if you manage to build a kingdom on earth, it's all going to go away if no later than the last day. On the other hand, trying to build our own kingdoms often leads us away from God. There's a reality that we need to face. There is no human being who can really ever be, quote, the king. We either live as children of God under his kingdom or we live as slaves of the devil in his kingdom. Last week we talked more about the devil trying to make us his slaves. Today we want to talk about God's kingdom. But we always run into this conflict, and that's exactly what happened to the people of Israel. By the time you get to Ezekiel's time in history, the northern kingdom of Israel, they've been wiped off the face of the earth by the Assyrians. They were were really the dominant kingdom a generation earlier. By the time you get to Ezekiel, the dominant world kingdom is the Babylonians. It's King Nebuchadnezzar. And they have now begun to take the leaders of the kingdom of Judah, that would be the southern kingdom of Israel, and transport them over to Babylon. And soon enough, it'll all be destroyed. In fact, since then, since about 586 BC, the nation of Israel has really been not much. You see that still in the news today. Well, let's back up a step. Why why did that happen? 
If you go all the way back to Moses, the government or the kingdom of Israel was ruled by God himself. Moses was the prophet. He was like the de facto leader, but God was in charge. And after that, there were more prophets and then there were judges. And then the people said, well, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And so they got Saul, not so good. Then they got David, good. Solomon, good. Most of the kings that came after Solomon, a few were good, but most of them were evil. Why? Because they cared more about their own kingdoms than God's. They cared more about their power, their wealth, their control, and in trying to build their own kingdoms, they usually led the nation, the people, away from the Lord. And so God sent prophets to call them to repentance, and God sometimes sent other kingdoms to call them to repentance. That's why God sent the Assyrians. He had enough. You had your chance, now your kingdom's gone. But there was something different about the kingdom of Judah. Can you think of why? God spared the kingdom of Judah, and he didn't wipe them off the face of the earth. Anyone want to be brave and offer a guess? I'll give you a clue. He made a promise. You know what the promise was? The promise of a savior. We heard that last week in Genesis 3, right? In the Garden of Eden, God promised that the seed, the offspring of the woman, would crush the devil's head. Later, he promised Abraham that he would have descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And through one of his descendants, all the other nations or kingdoms of the earth would be blessed. Eventually, he came to King David and promised that one of David's sons from the royal family, the royal line, would sit on the throne forever. And God remembered his promise. And so he couldn't destroy Judah. Instead... He continued to repeat his promise and also through prophecy. And that's exactly what we hear in the end of Ezekiel chapter 17. So I I just have to give you a minute of background. If you go home today, read Ezekiel 17. It's a fascinating chapter. The whole thing is a parable. God compares the nation of Israel, the earthly kingdom, to a splendid cedar. You might say, well, why a cedar? Because cedar trees were a big deal. It's the cedars of Lebanon, the big natural resource. But he said that an eagle came along and cut off or broke off the top of the tree. That's the first verse. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. He said, well, first, an eagle did that. He took the top of this cedar and he put it in a city of merchants. That's Babylon. Now, God comes back and says, I'm going to do something similar. Even though my nation, my people are living in Babylon, I remember my promise. So I'm going to break off the top of a tree again, and I'm going to plant it. But notice how he builds up. He said, I'm going to plant it, I'll break it off and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. God is not promising to reestablish the nation of Israel. There are Christians who believe that before Jesus comes back on the last day, the nation of Israel, the physical government, nation of Israel, needs to rise again to be a world power. That is not what the Bible says. God's talking about a different kingdom. But it would come from and through the nation of Israel. Because God promised to send a descendant of Abraham the human offspring of Eve, a descendant of Abraham, and the son of David to sit on the throne forever. Now, we know that's Jesus. The eternal son of God, who ruled over all nations and kingdoms because he's God, became human. He became a subject, so to speak, of the world, a citizen of the world, so that he could do what we heard about last week. So that he could crush the devil's head by resisting his every temptation. So that he could pay the debt that we owe God for our sin by his own holy precious blood and his own innocent suffering and death. So that he could conquer the last enemy, which is death, by rising from the dead. And then he ascended into heaven and he took his seat on the throne again. And now God has established his kingdom. But what exactly does that mean? So this last week... Uh, Lyle Zabel and I, he's the president of the church, we got to go to district convention. Every other year, all of the pastors, all of the male teachers, and one a male delegate from every church in the district gathers together, and we do business, but the first thing we usually do is worship, and then we study. And our paper this year was 
thy kingdom come. You might expect that a room full of pastors, teachers, and most of the time spiritually mature lay delegates would understand thy kingdom come. But here's what I learned. It's not about geography. God's kingdom is not about closing the southern border. Or now we hear people talking about the northern border. I'm not saying I'm against that. That's not what God's kingdom is about. God's kingdom is not about where does Russia end and Ukraine begin. God's kingdom is not about who's in charge of this little strip of land called Gaza that people have been fighting over for thousands of years. It has nothing to do with borders or geography. It really has nothing to do ultimately with human governments, any of them. And it also doesn't have to do with a specific group of people like the Jews, the nation of Israel or the Russians, or the Chinese, or the Ukrainians, or the United States of America and its citizens. It does have to do with people. But the reference that we hear in this kingdom, if the kingdom is like a tree, God wants to build a kingdom that's so large that birds of every kind, that people from every nation, tribe, and language can live under it. So what exactly is God's kingdom? It's this, it's an activity. It is God ruling over all things, but always for one purpose, for your salvation. And that doesn't begin on the day that you die. And we think about that. When I die, I want to go to heaven. But right now, the Lord is planting his kingdom. In fact, he's already planted his kingdom in your heart. In our gospel reading, Jesus used these other parables to remind us that the seed by which God plants his kingdom is his word. He taught us that when the seed is sown, the power to grow, it's not in the person who put out the seed. It's it's not really even in the soil. The, The power is in the seed. All the power of God's kingdom is built into his word. And as soon as that word hits your heart, It began to grow, even if we don't really know how. Now, it's also like a mustard seed, Jesus said. Little. It it looks so insignificant. I mean, the Bible, it's it's just a book, right? It's just words on a page put together in sentences and paragraphs and It's kind of old, and sometimes it's hard to understand. I mean, how can that be so powerful? It's powerful because that book and those words are the words of God, the very God who created the entire world by his word. And he's taken that word, and he's put it into your heart. And when it began to grow, at first it was just a little kernel of faith. And that faith was that Jesus is your Savior. That when Jesus died on the cross, God literally, actually forgave all of your sins. That faith tells you that because Jesus lived a perfect life, you don't have to try to be perfect to get into heaven. That faith is that because Jesus rose from the dead, that even when you or someone you love dies, that is not the end of life, but there's not only life for the soul right now, but there's a resurrection of the body to come on the last day. See, that faith, every time God's word is sown more and more and more in your, it continues to grow. And after a while, you have faith, not just that God forgave you and one day you'll go to heaven, but you have faith that when terrible things happen in life and you don't know why, God does. And that even though you can't see the silver lining in the cloud, you can't figure out how is this good. God promises that everything will work for your good. Even though it looks like, maybe it looks to us like the church is shrinking because in America, it it very well is. But across the world, we heard this at our district convention, across the world, as Paul said to the Colossians, the gospel is growing. There are people all over the world who have never heard the gospel and they too are coming to faith. So not only is the Lord planting his kingdom in you, he is also planting his kingdom among you. And I want to take just a minute this morning to appreciate fellow believers. But let's use the picture that God used. 
If you knew my father-in-law, Steve, many of you have met him. Uh, there, there's a lot of interesting things about Steve, but one thing is he likes birds. I know a lot of people like birds, but Steve really liked birds. And he had a tree in the front of his house. I don't know. It's not a cedar tree. It's a maple. It's an oak. I don't know my trees either. And he built a birdhouse condominium complex. And I'm not kidding. There's at least 12 to 15 birdhouses in this one tree. Now, I don't know if birds really want to commune together. I don't know if they want to, like, live in community. I don't know if they support and encourage one another. But the idea is that's what God wants for us. In fact, if you look at a tree, I don't think you've ever seen a living tree or seldom seen a living tree that has one branch. The tree has many branches, and God wants us to live in community with one another. Sometimes you hear people say, well, my faith is just between God and me. That's absolutely not true. It, it, it is between God and you, but not just. It's also between the fellow birds who are living in the tree. God wants us to come together and he wants to sow or plant his kingdom in our hearts together. And that's what we get to do when we worship together and we study God's word together and we come to communion together. God is then growing his kingdom, not just in each and every one of us, but also among all of us. And finally then, God also wants to plant his kingdom through you. Didn't God do an interesting thing when he created fruit or vegetables? Uh, if I get this technically wrong, please excuse me, but I think you'll get the idea. But if you plant a seed, like apples, you plant an apple tree, where do the seeds come from for the next tree? They're in the apple, right? The seed's in the fruit. And so when God planted his kingdom in you, where did the seeds come from to sow more seeds in more people? That's, that's also from you. And that starts at home. So fathers, happy Father's Day. If you want to build a kingdom, don't worry about mounting up wealth to pass on to your children. If you can do that, fine, but that's not the goal. Don't worry about building a kingdom so large that you need to have what it seems like is becoming common these days. You need to have a three-car garage and like a six-car pole barn or something like that to have all of your other toys. I mean, if God blesses you, great, but that's not the goal. Don't try to become just the CEO of the company because it makes you feel good that people trust you to, to make all the decisions and be in charge. If you want to build a kingdom, read God's word to your family. Get your wife and your children or your grandchildren or your nephews and your nieces or anybody that you can find and share God's word with them. Now, when you do that, you're not necessarily going to see a big difference that minute. You, you maybe not feel any different. It's kind of just like eating a meal. You eat and you, your tummy gets full, but you, you don't notice yourself growing. But God promises that what every single time we share God's word with one another, he's planting his kingdom. And if you want to leave an inheritance, there is no greater legacy or inheritance that you can leave than to bring people to heaven with you. So, maybe you don't have to water your garden today because it's raining outside. But the next time you go out to your garden or you look at your flowers or you check on your tomato plant, remember that the Lord compares his kingdom to planting. The Lord established his kingdom when he sent his own son to conquer Satan and to begin ruling in our hearts. And the goal of that kingdom, it's not just eternal salvation. But right now, God wants to fill your heart and your life with his blessings. He, he is your father. He wants to fill you with love. He, he wants to assure you of your forgiveness. He, he wants you to live in peace and joy and comfort. And he wants to do that now and into eternity. And not only for you, but God wants to plant his kingdom among you and through you. And so as you water your garden, give thanks to the Lord. That the Lord has and continues to plant his kingdom. All for your blessing. Amen.